what we're going to talk about is I first want to start with what is a professional. Many of you in here are students, and so you may think, I'm not a professional, I'm just a student. We're going to talk about that. Um, and then I also want to give you some sort of general principles, talk a little bit about first impressions. How you present yourself initially can really make or break how you're viewed, whether or not you get money, all those things. Um, part of that and how you present yourself is about attire. So I'm going to talk about that in some general ways. Um, of course, there's different attire if you're working in a startup versus if you're interviewing for a company for the first time. So we'll chat briefly about that. Then I'm going to talk about communication, specifically in greetings, being on the phone, whether it's your cell phone or an office phone, um, email, how you interact with email, and a little bit on social media. So that's what today's going to look like. I definitely invite your questions. I'm highly interruptible. So as I'm going through a topic area, if there's something that doesn't make sense to you or you want more information or you have a question about, just raise your hand. Let's stop and talk about what, what you're interested in. So finally, we're going to talk about all of this, what this looks like, and how to stand out positively. All right, I love this quote by Mark Twain, so I want to start us off with that. So Mark Twain was an author, and he had this quote that says, etiquette actually requires us to admire the human race. And it goes back to what I shared with you earlier, that because etiquette is ultimately about respect, that means admiring other people. Doesn't mean that you're gonna agree with other people about everything, but that you still have that admire, admiration and respect for them. So professionalism has sort of two parts. One is going to be specific to your field, whatever that field is, and one of those is going to be um, relevant to everybody. So specific to your field is the skills, the experiences, the knowledge that you would use in your individual role, things that are relevant to your specific job. Uh, keeping your skills current, whatever those skills might be. So it's really about growth. So professionalism isn't this picture that we have of this person wearing this three-piece suit necessarily. It's about this. It's about keeping your skills current, constantly growing, uh, making sure you're aware of, of what it looks like in, in your world, that being open to learning. The second part is across the board. It's going to apply for all of us the same way. So being attentive, being engaged with other people. Some of us are major introverts, some of us are major extroverts, and the rest of us are all on that continuum in between. No matter what, though, when you're with other people, the way for you to show that you're respecting them is by being engaged. Even if it's just a learning good smile and nod and asking the right questions. Um, it's also behaving in a courteous and conscientious manner. So thinking about other people around you as opposed to just thinking about yourself. So that's professionalism. Questions about that before we jump into some specific rules and guidelines? Okay, so let's talk about a few general applies to all, which is where I'm gonna focus most of the time today. Professionalism at work, what that looks like. Um, there are definitely different types of environments that are work environments. Some of them are going to be a lot more flexible, others are going to be a lot more rigid. Um, but in general, you use employer resources, whether that's time, money, um, equipment, for employer work, rather than for your own personal work. That might even include, in some cases, depending on your employer, not even using your work computer for anything other than work. Whereas others, we've seen a lot of blend between work and home and, and so forth, so then it's okay. So you really want to follow along with what your employer's guidelines are individually, but generally, no employer resources for your personal use. Um, along those same lines, even your own cell phone, if you're at work, because in the end then you're taking your employer's time, you want to make sure that you minimize that. Now, of course, there's some things that you just have to do during the normal work hours. Most employers are okay with that as long as it's kept to a minimum, as long as you do it on your breaks, that kind of thing. I would say, though, unless social media is your job, which I know some of you hear, that is your job, um, but unless social media is your job, I would try to stay off social media um, as much as possible. We all know what a sucker of time social media tends to be, but if you're like, oh, I'm just going to go on and post this one thing, um, then it, it kind of goes on and on and on. So be as careful and cautious about that at work as possible. Um, and then the thing about not using it in cubicles, that's more about your phone and your personal calls and those kinds of things. People don't want to know your business necessarily, so try to take that in a private space somewhere else. 
This one is really important. So as, as Emily shared, I work with the School of Chemical Sciences. So for us, lab safety rules are critical. And um, even things like what I have on my feet today, I've just got sandals on, would not be acceptable in a, in a lab because of safety rules. So if I'm going around, and this is the employment I've chosen, and I'm complaining about the lab safety rules, that's not being a, a good professional. So these are the norms of this company. If there's something that you think needs to be changed, absolutely talk to your supervisors, but don't go around and complain about them. See the difference? All right. Uh, generally, don't call negative attention to yourself at work, so that can be how you're behaving, how you're looking, any of those things. Uh, this is a really important rule, and again, varies a little bit from employment type to employment type or a specific employer. Uh, but as much as possible, if there's an event starting at such and such time or a meeting or whatever, you want to be on time or even maybe five or so minutes early. Uh, if you know there's going to be a situation like this, you actually all did a really nice job today, but try to come even a few minutes early to get your food and get settled before the event actually starts. On the flip side of that, if it's a meeting with a specific time, try not to leave early. So, hey, we're going to have this um, staff meeting from 8 to 9 tomorrow. Leaving at 8.45 doesn't present a good professional impression of you, especially if it's something that you do over and over and over again. Now, again, Certain times, you have to. You've got another meeting or whatever. In those cases, be sure to let the person who's organizing that meeting know in advance, hey, I've got another meeting at such and such, I'm going to need to leave at 8.45. Then it's usually okay. Again, as long as it's not a habitual situation. As I mentioned before, it's important to learn, learn to be a great listener um, and to engage in the teamwork. And that looks different in different tech places, but in general, it's not stealing credit from somebody else's idea. Uh, presenting it, if you want to share their idea, say, hey, this was this person's idea as opposed to making it sound like it was your idea. Jumping in to help if you're done with your work or if there's a skill that you have that you can help contribute to another project. Being willing to do that, not taking it over, but being willing to help out and share your expertise. That's being a good team player and definitely makes an impact. This one is important, particularly for those of you who maybe haven't had a lot of professional work experience yet. You probably have some great ideas about what's wrong with things. And that's fine, and most bosses want to hear that, but they want to know suggestions for how to improve something. So don't just be that person who's saying all the time, this is wrong, and this is terrible, and this doesn't work, and this. So then you kind of come across as someone who's just negative. But if you can say, hey, this is something that I feel like is broken, and maybe here are a couple of things that we can do to fix it. Not coming in and saying, I know all the answers because I'm whatever, but saying, here are a few options. Most supervisors are going to love that initiative and that forthrightness of, hey, I've thought this through and I care about this place. So as you, as you present an issue, make sure you present those, those potential solutions as well. If somebody comes to you and you don't have the answer, find out who does before just saying, I don't have the answer. It's kind of that whole thing people used to say, oh, that's not my job description. Well, technically, most job descriptions have a line at the bottom that says other duties is assigned, so that can encompass a lot. So make sure if there's something that you don't know the answer to or you're not the person that you try to find who is before you put that person on. All right, so I mentioned first impressions are important, and that encompasses a lot of things. Most of the time, we make snap judgments about people as we meet them split second, not even a full second before you create an impression on somebody else or before someone judges you based on how you're presenting yourself. So first impressions are hard to overcome if they're a negative first impression. They're possible. If you have lots of repeated positive um, second and third and fourth impressions, but they are difficult to overcome initially. So you want to make sure that that first impression is a positive one when you're meeting someone new. In fact, companies are often spending millions of dollars on advertising and training and all these things, but if you meet someone you know, on your first encounter walking into that organization who's negative or rude or looks like they're not paying attention, suddenly all those millions of dollars have gone to waste. So, um, like I said, negative and first impressions are possible to overcome, but a little bit difficult. I will also share that business etiquette rules do differ slightly from rules when you're hanging out with your friends. So probably you don't ever want to put your feet up on somebody else's chair ever, whether you're a guest in their home or out at McDonald's or at a fancy dinner. 
But there are, are other things that, that can vary. So if you are going to a job interview, like I said, you're going to dress differently than if you're going on a regular day of work. Uh, so knowledge, skills, work ethic, all of those things are important in creating a positive first impression, but having good respect and common courtesy are important um, as well. So keeping all those things in mind. And ultimately, like I said at the beginning, it's not just about the rules, it's about respect. Um, all right, so another quote by H. Jackson Brown Jr. this time, and um, he shared that good manners sometimes mean putting up with other people's bad manners. So one of the things about etiquette is you kind of have to take what we call the high road. So even if somebody else is lazy or not doing their job or whatever, not that you should take abuse ever, but there's a difference between putting up with somebody's bad etiquette and just dealing with it. Um, or joining in or complaining or whatever. So the only time you actually should correct someone is if you are their supervisor. So if you're supervising someone or someone has, I guess the second time, if someone has specifically asked you to correct their behavior or give you feedback, um, then those are the only two times. So if it's just your buddy or your friend, no, you don't get a chance to tell them that they're eating like a slob. Um, but come to things like this, send them to me and I'll be happy to teach them as well. Uh, so customer service rules. Always make eye contact when somebody walks in. Uh, make sure that you are giving that person your focus, whether it's your boss or a fellow employee or a customer. Uh, make sure that you're not assisting somebody else and still talking to somebody else. Like Focus on who you're with. Uh, also, make sure you're not talking about anyone or any other company in front of other people. So I had a student a couple of years ago who uh, went to one of our career fairs and was, was talking to a consumer products company and talking badly about one of their competitors. And he thought that was the way to get on this company A's good graces is by saying, oh, company B is terrible. But instead what it did is it made company A think negatively about the student. Um, they know who their competitors are. They know probably better than we as job seekers what their the other competitors' strengths and weaknesses are. But when you come in and try to bash another company or make them look bad, it actually makes you look bad. So make sure that you're not talking about anyone else in a demeaning way. Uh, make sure that you're not working on tasks if somebody's waiting to talk with you. If there's something that you're like really close, almost done, and you just need to finish it, you can let them know, hey, I'll be with you in two minutes or some, you know, give them a specific thing, but make sure you at least acknowledge them. Um, and then don't just like say, oh, they're down there around the hall. If you can, if you can walk them to it, it makes a big difference. It shows that you're really willing to go out of their way. I know it takes time away from your work, um, but usually not that much time. And it makes a big difference and it's a it's a positive impression. If you promise something, Make sure you're giving a reasonable expectation of what, what the timeline or whether or not it's something you can do. Don't overpromise and underdeliver. Actually, deliver on what you're saying you're going to give. All right, so let's talk about attire just a little bit. Again, this is going to be sort of generalized, but make sure that your clothing isn't giving more of a message than you are in a negative way that is. So dressing professionally does demonstrate respect, but professional looks different depending on your type of um, organization. I think one of the best things you can do is find out the dress code in advance. So if you're going to a new place of work, ask, you know, what's the expected dress code? Um, I often have heard, dress like the person whose job you want. So if the person whose job you really ultimately want wears a sports jacket, then that's what you should wear too. So make sure that you're constantly forward looking. In general, no matter what type of an employment place you're in, you want to minimize bare skin. Of course, when it's summer, we have a little bit more flexibility than during the school year. Um, but again, pay attention to if you have certain safety rules or whatever. Details do matter still. So um, unless you're in a really creative place, you might not you might not want to wear more muted colors. You know, if you're in a creative place and you want to wear your Mickey Mouse socks and they're good with that, by all means do so. Not for the job interview, but from the job. But if you're in a different type of place that doesn't value the Mickey Mouse socks, then don't wear them, obviously. Strong smells, no matter what you're in, whether they're good smells like perfume or cologne or um, that flowery lotion that you can buy at Bath and Body Works, or bad smells like body odor or um, cigarettes sometimes, no matter what, any strong smell is not a good strong smell. 
So when you're working in close proximity with someone, they might have um, irritations to even something that smells really good, um, like food or, um, like I said, the, the fruity smelling lotions. So be aware of the people that you're around. And just a general rule is that business casual is typically not as casual as you think it is. So it still is pretty, um, you know, fairly formal. So if an employer does tell you we wear business casual, make sure you ask for what that means to that particular employer. All right, let's talk about greetings a little bit. Who has ever had somebody give them feedback on what their handshake is like? Anybody? Okay. You want to come up here for a hot second? Since you've had feedback before. I didn't tell you you were going to have to do that. All right, so I would encourage you to practice your handshake with someone and ask for some honest feedback. Um, but in general, there's a couple things. I'm going to show you a few pictures in a hot second. Um, but you want to make sure that you have a good positive handshake. Yes, handshakes went away for a little while during the pandemic, but they're very much back. So if we're going to shake hands, yeah, yay. Good, I knew you'd have a good one. All right, so make sure that you look at the webs of our thumbs are touching. Um, and we're standing about an arm's length apart. We're facing each other, um, and like he did, about three pumps, and then let it go. All right, you can sit back down. Yay, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, put you on the spot. But how you, how you shake hands is important, and it gives a positive or negative impression of you. So stand if you're sitting and somebody comes up to you. Make eye contact, smile, even if you don't normally smile. Like, at least smile when you're greeting somebody. And then make sure you also know how to use proper introductions. And they're not as complicated as you think. Um, basically, with a proper introduction, you say the most important person's name first. This is, and then the other person. That's all you have to say. I don't have to use a lot of fancy words or anything like that. But um, Tom, this is Mary, if Tom is the CEO of the company. The one exception to either age or title being the most important would be if you have a customer. A customer is always, always, always the most important. Um, and also have a good closing. So you've got that good handshake, you know how to say hello, you've maybe asked a couple of questions. Now it's time to leave. You don't want to stand talking to this person anymore, either they're really boring, or maybe you just kind of run out of things to say. So practice a closing, just like you would practice an opening. My favorite, which you're welcome to steal, is something along the lines of, I'm sure you have a lot of people that you want to talk to at this event, so I don't want to monopolize your time, but it's been so nice talking with you. So that kind of makes it sound like you're doing them a favor, even though it might be like, I don't want to talk to this person anymore. So practice something, memorize it so that you can have that ready to go, and then you can share that um, as you're trying to escape, so to speak, a conversation. If you forget somebody's name, it's okay to ask it again. Now you probably want to try to pay attention the second time, um, rather than asking a third or a fourth time, but it's okay. I would rather be called by the right name than have you forget and, and just say, oh, um, no, I'm trying to do a different name, uh, Pam, or something like that, because my name is Patricia. Again, just like I said, shared earlier, be sure to always pay attention to what other people are saying. And learn how to mix and mingle. Honestly, a lot, of, a lot of us don't like that, but it's a skill just like anything else. So we're not, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. I know you've got an elevator pitch um, session coming up later this summer. Go to that, because that'll help with this a lot. Um, but practice some questions. Write out some questions in advance. I'm going to a conference. What types of questions could I ask at that conference? I'm doing a um, fire at five thing. What types of questions could I ask somebody at that? It's okay to practice and memorize those in advance. In fact, it, it makes you sound more polished. So definitely do that, just like you would any other skill. If you have to wear a name tag, you always go on the right, by the way, um, as we were shaking hands. That way you'd be able to look up that person's arm right to the, up here. Um, I, I know a lot of people wear lanyards and so forth. Generally, in a mix and mingle event, try to get rid of the lanyards if you can, or at least have them high enough so that they don't have to look down at your navel. Um, but in general, if you're writing it out, use your full name. Try to write legibly. All right, so let's talk about phone calls. I mentioned that earlier. When you have a phone call coming in, and this is specifically at work, 
Make sure that you're treating it importantly. And if you do get somebody who leaves you a voicemail or a message in some format, try to respond within one business day. Now, if you are out of the office for an extended period of time, make sure that the person who would be taking the messages or that your voicemail is updated to reflect that. Include your name and your organization when you answer the phone. Don't just say hello. Uh, because a lot of times we get the wrong number and they want to make sure that they have the right number. And also include your first name. Don't assume that caller ID is right. So if you picked up the phone because you think um, uh, toy is calling you and it's not toy, it, it's going to make you sound silly. So make sure that you don't just assume you answer the phone the same way all the time. And then if you do have to put speak, somebody on speaker, and that would also include if you're in a Zoom or a Web, WebEx meeting and you're using your computer speakers instead of headphones, make sure they understand why. Um, you know, sorry, my headphones broke this morning. I have to have you on, on the computer speakers. And if there's anybody else with an earshot, let the person know that. And they don't want to say something that might um, be bad, heard by the wrong ears. So make sure you let them know those pieces. If somebody is calling your place of business, you should always be the last person to hang up. Um, so that way, if there's a last minute, like, oh, I forgot to ask about this, they have the opportunity to do that. If you are making calls, and again, this is work-related calls, always introduce yourself first and explain why you're calling. Even if you know that the person who's just answered the phone because they shared their name when, when they picked up the phone isn't the right person, they can probably give you more information if they know why you're calling. So if, if I were to call Emily and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for, but I don't reach Emily, somebody else can probably tell me, well, Emily's out until next week, or she left this for you. But if I just said I need Emily and don't explain why I'm calling or who I am, they can't do that. Um, and remember, no matter what, the person that you have called always has priority, even if your boss walks into your office. That person that you called has the priority. When you're leaving a message, always leave a full message even if you know that you're the only Patricia they know, still say it's Patricia Simpson calling, just so that they can be sure that they have that information. Again, this is primarily work-related. Um, cell phones, make sure that your volume isn't up too loud. Um, if you do have a fun ringtone, which are generally acceptable, make sure it's not too obnoxious um, or vulgar or anything like that. And when you're talking on it, I guess use your inside voice. Remember that there's probably people around you if the call gets lost or dropped, the person who originated the call is the one who calls back. I'm, this is one of my mission items. I'm, if the whole world knew this, we would stop playing, playing that voicemail back and forth into people's voicemail boxes. Um, so whoever originates the call and the cell phone call gets dropped is the one who calls back. Uh, generally, you don't want to use your phone any place that you would not be talking to your neighbor at full volume. And that not using your phone means not for talking, not for text, not for data in any way. If you are in a place where you can talk to your neighbor at full volume, by all means, use that phone. The one exception would be if somebody specifically says, hey, please go to your calendars and see if this date is available or look this piece of information up for me. And that's them giving you permission to use your phone. Otherwise, keep those phones away. And then if you're at a meeting or especially if you're at a meal, Make sure that that phone is never placed on the table. It just makes it look like you care more about the phone than about the person that you're there in real life with. So again, those phones should be sort of on the side as opposed to in a girl piece. Uh, again, different companies have different sort of uh, norms on this, but in general, you can text an hour before or two hours after your normal working hours. Otherwise, any kind of communication should be email. Um, otherwise, there's this expectation that you have to answer your texts at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, again, different companies have different norms on this, but this is sort of the across-the-rule um, regular one. And then this is why. Like I said, it makes it feel like you care more about the phone or you're not aware of yourself and how you're presenting yourself if you're too focused on using your phone when you're with other people. Questions about phones? Okay. Briefly, I'm going to talk about email. The biggest thing to walk away with with email is intentionally or unintentionally, remember that every message is out there in writing and could potentially be forwarded to somebody that you might not want it forwarded to. So an example from my real life, uh, one of my really good friends was um, invited to the same uh, baby shower that I was invited to. So they, 
in the office, they were having um, a gift and so forth for this woman who was having a baby. And my friend didn't like this woman very well, so thought she was emailing me and said, why would I buy a gift? I don't like this person. I would never want to buy a gift. Instead, I sent it to the person who was actually hosting the party, which was not me. So it, it was an easy mistake. She, instead of hitting, she hit reply instead of forward, and it happens to all of us. But make sure that you don't write anything down that you don't want somebody to have a record. Okay, utilize spell check, reread your messages. I know a lot of times people will have like a please excuse the errors, I sent this from my phone. That's just actually being lazy. So reread your phone uh, messages, make sure that everything is, is presenting yourself in the right um, format. And with email, don't use text to speak. It's, you know, text is a different format, different medium. You want to make sure you're using the right medium for the right um, thing. So don't just write K and hit respond. Um, or hit send on your email. Most of us get way too many emails as it is. I don't need an email that just says K and nothing else. Um, so I, I guess I mentioned this already. Don't use it in place of IM or text. Use the right medium for the right type of interactions. If you are sending an email, always include a subject line. The ma vast majority of us are looking at our emails on our phones, so I need to know if this is something I need to open right now or if it can wait. And that subject line helps that. Also include a greeting, even if it's just hello, don't just start into your message. Now, if it's, you've gone back and forth with the person a few times, and it's maybe the third you know, back and forth, or even the second, it's okay to skip the greeting. But an initial email should always have a, hello, Patricia, or just even a Patricia, or something like that on it. Also include a full message. Like I said before, I don't want a message that just says K, hey, or even one that just says thanks, and nothing else. Um, you know, at least say thank you for filling that form out for me, or whatever it is that I've just done. Messages in general should be short. If you're writing, you know, three pages in an email, again, remember we're looking on our phones, so it would be better to pick up the phone or go to that person's office directly as opposed to trying to send an email. And if it does get too long, bullets can help a little bit. I would also caution against using all of these things, so carbon copy, blind carbon copy, reply all, unless it's absolutely necessary. Because the person who initially sent out the email said, um, send me your time and your availability. I'm just a, a participant in the meeting. I don't need to know what all these other people's part time is. So make sure you're using, again, the right thing for the right situation. So if somebody really does need to be carbon copied, by all means do so. Line carbon copy is usually because you don't either, one of two things, you don't want the other people to know who else has received their message. So if you're responding to somebody that you want to CC your boss, but you don't want the person to know that you bought them, then blind carbon copy would be good there. Or if you have a big list, if you put it in blind carbon copy, it keeps everybody from getting this big list of email addresses. So those would be the two times to use blind carbon copy. Um, but do all sparingly. And then again, like I said previously, make sure you're using your work email for work and not for personal. Uh, oh, this last one that's cut off says out of office messages. So I did mention that with your phone, but the same thing would be with your email. So if you're going to be out of the office for a few days, make sure to include those automatic out of office messages so we know not to expect an email immediately. Social media, again, follow your employer's guidelines just like with everything else I've shared. Try to stay professional though. Even if you're you know, more of a casual, laid-back tone on social media. If it's a work social media, stay professional. Um, be present. I think it's good to, to have social media, both for personal and for professional. A lot of people stay in connections that way. But I also think it's important to have a purpose and a plan. So before you jump on to a new social media medium, make sure you kind of, kind of figure out how you want to use that or for what purposes or who you're going to connect with or not connect with um, and, and be specific with those rules. In all cases, I would encourage you to use humor cautiously, to use negativity cautiously, even if it's your own personal social media. So I had a student a couple years ago who was working in dining services and we all know it's maybe not the greatest, most glorious job, but was constantly complaining on her Twitter feed about, oh, dining services stinks, I hate working there, this is terrible. And I actually had a pro an employer who was thinking of hiring her who looked at her Twitter feed and saw how negative she was, 
totally different job, but chose to not hire her based on that because he felt like she was going to bring a negative attitude to his workplace. So it's important to just really be cautious about how you use social media. I guess one more example, which seems harmless, uh, but one of my PhD students had um, an interview with, again, again, another consumer products company, and it was his dream job. He thought it was so great, and so he posted that on his Facebook back in the day and said, oh, I'm so excited. This, you know, this company is super great. The interview went really well. Well, another recruiter from another consumer products company happened to be friends with him on Facebook and didn't give him an interview, and I was kind of shocked because he was a really good student. So I asked her when she was on campus, why didn't Ryan get an interview? And she said, well, he's going to this other company. You know, it sounded like it's all wrapped up and it's all good. It's his dream company, so why didn't, I've got a lot of candidates. I didn't want to bother with him. Well, guess what? He didn't get the job at the first company. So sometimes something that seems harmless can come back and hurt you. So either lock down your privacy settings on your personal social media accounts or just be very cautious about what you post. And humor is one of those things that can, if they don't know you well, it can come across the wrong way. So it might be perfectly funny to you and all your friends that know you well, but if somebody's sort of a peripheral, peripheral follower of yours on social media and maybe doesn't know you personally as well, it might not come out the same way. So if you're a funny person, that's great, but still try to use humor cautiously on social media. Um, follow the same guidelines as email. So in general, you want to make sure that you're proofreading and so forth. It doesn't mean you have to put periods every place a period needs to go grammatically, but as much as possible, proofread, make sure it sounds good before you post. And then, again, I know I've mentioned this several times already, but if you are physically with people, make sure that you're physically with those people. Don't be getting on your social media. Um, back to another example to share with you. One of my students had an interview with a company out in Pennsylvania. And as part of that interview, they said, hey, this is a casual dinner. We want you to ask the questions you want. Just, just laid back and informal. So my student pulled out his phone. He's like, oh, cool. I'm going to get on my phone and check and see what's going on in my world back home. Because of that one act, the company chose not to hire him. Anybody have an, a guess why? Yeah? They thought that you would do that when it was more formal. That too, that he would do that in a more formal setting. But to them, this was a time to talk and to get to know them as a company. And if he was more interested in getting on his phone than he wasn't getting to know them, he probably didn't really care about the company. He wasn't really interested. So because he wasn't interested, or that was their perception, he didn't get the job. All right, so networking is hard. How many of you in here would say you're lend towards being an introvert? It's OK. Yeah, OK. Many of us are. Uh, a couple of tips and rules that are going to help you with this, but also that those of you who are extroverts should pay attention to as well. So if there is an event, like even today, for example, or anything that you have to go to where they ask for you to register or to RSVP to let them know you're coming, make sure you do so. And if you say you're coming, unless it's an emergency, you need to show up. On the flip side of that, if they say you need to register and you don't, you don't get to go. So this really didn't, I heard this a lot, but until I actually got married and planned a big wedding, it didn't really hit home to me. But when you're, you're spending a lot of money on people's food, or even just a little bit of money on people's food, and then they don't show up, it's, it stinks, really. So make sure if you say you're going to come, unless, I mean, right, if you get COVID or something emergency happens, um, that's a, a, a different thing. But in general, if you say you're coming, come. If you don't say you're coming, don't come. Um, and along these same lines, if there is food, like say I've been at an event like this, make sure you don't overload your plate. Um, I do a whole thing on a dining etiquette too, like I said, and I don't want to get into it super far, but um, because there are a lot of people, make sure that you are showing respect to the other people by leaving food. So, I don't know, normally the rule is two things, but I would say probably with something like this, start with one, if there's food left, then you can go back for two. But don't be there for the food. Most of these events are really more about the event and what you're going to learn, or about the job interview and what you're going to get out of, hopefully a job, than they are about, hey, we get a meal or we get, you know, whatever the case might be. So keep that in mind. When you're at an event, 
make sure you prepare those both opening and closing like I talked about earlier. It really can be helpful because normally the opening and the closing are the time that you're like, uh, I don't know what to say right now. So if you prepare and practice and memorize a question or two, it helps a lot. I would encourage you, even those of you who are raise your hands that you're more introverted, to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. It's great to go with a friend, but if you stick with that friend the whole time, you might miss out on a really amazing contact or interaction that you could have had. So go with a friend, but as soon as you get there, leave, or just don't go with a friend at all. Be purposeful. If you can look for a way to help other people, it gives you a reason to be there too. I think a lot of times we go to networking things and we think, hey, I'm here to get something out of this. I'm here to get a job, or I'm here, and it just feels awkward. It feels kind of used car salesman -y. No, No offense to anybody who has sold cars or anything for that matter, but it feels like kind of yucky. But if you can go in with the thought of how can I meet somebody that I can help, it gives you a purpose. And it might be you connecting to somebody else. Oops, that's not the next bullet. There's a bullet that says be a catalyst to people. Think of how you can generate momentum and help other people, connect to other people. Maybe if you're talking to companies even as a student, they want to know what the student voice is, what the student's thoughts are on things. So how can you help with that? I think if you can have that purpose in mind as opposed to what I can get out of it, but maybe how can I help somebody else that I meet, it makes those events a lot easier. You do want to learn small talk. Who knows a few things that you can, you can just shout them out. Things that you can talk about in a networking professional business setting that are small talk. Weather. Weather, absolutely. Food, sports, yeah, Nuggets won last night, Woo Sorry, Heat fans. Others? What about if you are on a college campus and you're with a bunch of other students? What can you talk about? School. School. What your major is? What classes are you Classes, maybe RSOs, things you're involved with, okay? So how can those things translate into talking to a whole bunch of employers? Major, job title, you know, what do you do? Um, one thing I actually learned from uh, a speaker a couple of years ago back that I have used, and it's really fun, so I would love to see you guys use it too. If somebody talk, starts talking to you about what they do, if your response is, wow, that sounds challenging. Now, don't be disingenuous or disingenuous about it, but if you really think, oh, that's kind of interesting, but if you say, wow, that sounds challenging, suddenly they feel heard, and they're going to talk a lot more. And then it kind of fills up all that space. So little tricks like that, knowing some specific topics, like, okay, I'm going to prepare a question about the weather, or I'm going to prepare something, a statement about parking, or whatever. Things that you can work on up front and think, like, oh, I'm going to talk about this, it helps fill that space and makes it easier. Open-ended questions are always great. So not just what's your job title, but what do you do? That can be really helpful as well. There's that catalyst that I mentioned earlier. Again, just like I've talked about several times, try not to hide behind technology. It feels safer, um, but you miss out on interactions in many cases. If you are at a place where people have business cards, ask for those business cards, that's fine, or even share your own if you have them. Students, by the way, can make um, business cards through printing services. You have to pay for them yourselves, of course, but um, you do have that option if you want to create like a student business card, too. All right, the final thing I want to talk about is thank you notes. Thank you notes are important, and we don't do them enough. I think it's key to always express appreciation. So if somebody does something for you or gives you something or hosts something, it's really amazing if you send just a little, hey, thanks. If you have a job interview, whether it's for a full-time or internship or anything, absolutely make sure you send a thank you note. I would say within 24 hours. The rule used to be 24 to 48, but so many decisions are made much more quickly than that. So if you can send it within 24 hours, an email is fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything major, like three or four sentences. Hey, thank you for meeting with me on such and such date or at such and such location. I enjoyed learning about whatever you learned about about their company. And I look forward to hearing from you about your decision. Thank you, sincerely in your name. That's it. But sending one can make a big difference. I've heard so many stories. So I've been here at Illinois, like Emily said, for 15 years, but I've actually been in career services for closer to 30, and so many stories through the years of a student who sent a thank you note ends up getting the job. 
Um, sometimes it's just because they move you to the next level. Um, they see that, they express that expressed appreciation, and it means something because so few people send them. We had a career fair a couple years ago where one of our recruiters was standing in line for lunch, and she was flipping through her phone, and she got an email from a student she talked to about an hour before that. And she actually put down her plate in the buffet line, went back into the fair, and moved that student's resume from her maybe pile to her yes pile um, because of that one little thank you note. So she did, she still had an interview and all of that, but it, it moved her, bumped her up because she took the time to do that. If somebody does a big favor for you, work-wise or otherwise, send them an email. Thank you. Make sure that you express that appreciation, and usually the rule is one week. If somebody gives you a gift, even if you're exchanging gifts, it's a good idea to, to send a thank you note within two weeks. Um, and wedding gifts, you have a little bit more time because they expect you're maybe out traveling on your honeymoon or something. So you have, you have a few more months then. I would encourage you to handwrite any note for something that somebody does big for you. So a professor writes you a reference letter, that's a big thing that took them some time. Handwrite a little note, stick it under the door. Um, if somebody saves you big time at work, make sure you send them a little handwritten note. They won't ever probably get them again, but it makes a big difference and it's very memorable. Um, if it's something smaller, a favor, or whatever, email is perfectly fine, an interview email is perfectly fine. But if it's something that's impactful or took a lot of time for them, a handwritten note is always better. All right, so what happens, I've shared a lot of rules, what happens if you screw up? What happens if that email goes to the wrong person like I shared earlier or whatever the case might be? You know, how you respond afterwards is just as important. We're all human, we're all gonna make a mistake. You're gonna be at a job interview and tip over a whole pitcher of water. Something's gonna happen in your lifetime that probably doesn't go the way you want it to. So apologize um, and then move on from there. The other thing I would say is if you do apologize, also don't overdo it. So I had a student um, in a class with a professor who was very hard about no cell phones. And of course, inevitably, her cell phone rang. She thought she turned it off, so she went up and like immediately shut it off and apologized. After the class was over, she went up to the professor and apologized again. Then she went back to her residence hall and she sent an email apologizing again. So the professor told me about this story. It's like one apology suffices. It's fine. Um, don't just kind of keep going on and on and on about it. So make sure you apologize and to do so sincerely. Don't just be like, oh, sorry. But to sincerely apologize, but then let it go and move on. And be positive after that. So don't get stressed out about every single rule that you neglect having a good interaction with people. Because ultimately, I hope what you walk away with today is that yes, these rules are here, but what's most important is the people and interacting in a positive way and treating other people with respect. All right, I went through a bunch of stuff. Uh, questions at all about anything? Yeah. No, this is just not a question, but about the emails, something that I do sometimes goes uh, wrong. Oh, I can give you this so everybody can hear you. Well, something else, sometimes we send and I say, oh, God, oh, for an accident that, that is gone. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I put 30 seconds safety delay. <laughs> so, and it saved me quite a bit of time. Yeah, I like that. So I hope you all heard that um, he's got a, like a 30 second safety delay on his email, so if something comes up. One thing I have seen people do is do a recall of a message, and actually that usually doesn't work. Most systems don't recall the way you're supposed to, so they still see the first message, now they see that you've recalled it, and then they see the second message. So that is a much better plan if you have the option on your email to do that. So yeah, great, thank you for sharing. I think I saw another hand somewhere. Not. Okay, well, I just want to end with this quote that manage, or manners are sensitive awareness of the feelings of other people. And if you have that awareness, you have good manners no matter which fork you use or whether or not you remember to, you know, proofread your email the way you should. So Emily Post is somebody who's been writing about um, etiquette for a long time. So if she says this, I think it's got to be true. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm also going to stick around here for a few minutes because I know that there might be questions that people didn't want to ask in front of everybody else. Um, so feel free to come up. Also, if you want some feedback in your handshake, 
happy to do that as well. Good luck. Remember, it's all about respect. <laughs>